Okay, we are now recording. Um, I'm going to do a mic check here. How's the volume sound in the back of the room? I know there's somebody in the back there. Excellent. Okay. We All right, it's 10.38. I think we should get started. Um, everyone seen Dave's keynote this morning? You like that? They, I took uh, some notes here because I think one of the things he said ties in pretty well with where I'm going. He said, most organizations' threat models only entail what's publicly known through open source and threat intelligence. Investment in, instead of investment in people, it goes into tools and technology. Humans need to investigate and identify abnormal patterns of behavior. And what I'm going to do is really build on that. Um, my name is Craig Stones. I consider myself mostly a software engineer, although I do work in the security space quite a lot. And to the extent that I have a, a superpower or something unique to bring to the table, it's that I put a lot of effort into building bridges uh, between development and the security community, and also between development and QA, security and QAs. We'll get into that a little bit, but first I want to say um, my slides are online right now. If you go to speakerdeck.com slash craigstones, um, if you're the sort of person who likes to have uh, the slide decks available to you, uh, feel free to go to that URL. I'll give you a minute to uh, copy that down. All right, so like I said, I like to build bridges. Um, I, I like to uh, look at the computer science, the theoretical computer science community, find interesting ideas and try and bring them into the mainstream. Um, I like to reach out to communities that I know that are full of smart people, but maybe who don't really talk to each other, try and bring them together. I look for interesting techniques in the security community and try and make them uh, better well-known, more well-known to developers, I suspect. A lot of you are familiar with fuzzing, but I just was doing some code mesh talks, and I said, how many people here know what a fuzzer is? And I would get like two hands going up. So I thought, hmm, this is something people should know more about. Um, last year, I had a client uh, reach out and tell me they wanted me to give their developers OWASP training. And I said, can you be a little bit more specific than OWASP training? And they said, no. We have a contract with one of our customers, and they require us to have OWASP training. So we need you to do that. And um, I cannot in good conscience give an hour presentation on the OS Top 10. It's full of good ideas, but I don't think it's sufficient to develop a secure application. So I started really thinking, uh, a lot of the presentations I've done in the past have been pretty niche, but I started thinking, what would it look like to really write down what I know about secure application development and working with a software development team, and what would that look like as, as just sort of a... So, if those of you who saw the quotes um, coming in, well, there, there was one that really hit home with me. It says, we've been pushing developer education as a solution for security for like 10 years, and it hasn't worked. And as someone who talks about security, um, that tells me that I'm failing. So I want to do better, and I started looking like, how can we really get the message of security out? And the truth is, there's nothing you can tell a developer that will make them write secure application. What, what we really need to do is get the security community and the development community engaged from the beginning. And so I started, I did a presentation for the client to talk about more the general idea of building secure software. But then I took it to CodeMesh, uh, which is a, an interesting conference because you get um, a lot of developers, but also a lot of security people as well. So there, there's an interaction that you, you don't see in other venues necessarily. And I started looking into university research about what does it mean to build secure applications. And I, I found some uh, interesting work uh, from Indiana University. Um, and so this is the first time that I've given this talk at an exclusively a security event, so I'm really interested in your feedback. And I hope that you'll come up and chat with me at lunch or, at, or after the talk, um, because I am, I am very, very much interested in building bridges between the security community and the developer community. I honestly believe it's the only hope we have for solving these problems. So I want to get your take on this as well. Um, here's where I'm going. Building secure software is hard, 
Um, we, we often end up trying to produce checklists that we can follow. And just having a developer follow a checklist, and one thing we know empirically is it doesn't result in secure code. Um, so I want to ask, is there a methodology we can follow to do this right? I'm going to lean really heavily on um, some academic research called the Information Security Practice Principles um, from Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Uh, that should be the only time you hear me use the C word in this presentation. So let's start at the beginning. Um, how do you get started as a doctor? Okay. What you have on the screen is a modern version of one of the oldest binding documents in human history. Um, many doctors start their careers with the Hippocratic Oath. Um, but what if you don't want to become a doctor? What if you want to become a construction worker? Well, step one to becoming a construction worker is to say safety is our first priority. Okay? How do software engineers start our careers? <laughs> so, as someone who's concerned about security, I like the other ones better. And I think that we need to look at what people in other professions have done over the years uh, when, when they're talking about human safety, see if we can learn from that. It really works. Um, exactly zero passengers were killed worldwide in air transportation in 2017, which is a remarkable record. Um, however, experts caution that we're not likely to have these good numbers going forward because y'all are carrying laptops and they tend to explode. Um, so that's a weird thing. Imagine saying to someone in 1968 that the biggest risk in air transportation in 2018 would be the computing industry's disregard for human safety. That's a, that's a strange thing to think about. So, what I want to say is, what if we reimagine how we do software? What if we approach software in the same way that we approach medicine and construction and other fields of human endeavor? What would that look like? And this is not an original idea to me. Um, the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, the professional organization for computer scientists, right now is updating its code of ethics. And the very first idea in the ACM's code of ethics is that our first obligation is to look after human safety, not just for ourselves and our users, but for all the stakeholders in the industry. Um, it's really easy, and, and this, is, this is something that, that developers fall into a lot, you know, to say writing great software would be just easy if it weren't for those darn users, right? Um, computing today, I think we're at a really similar place to where we were at the start of the Industrial Revolution. We're really enjoying this new productivity we found, but we're starting to notice that there's some smog in the air and people are getting killed in the factories. So I'm going to talk about what it means to bring safety to software engineering. But first I want to say, what does security even mean, really? Because we use the word to mean very different things. You know, it could be mama cat and her kittens, or it could be a barbed wire fence, and to my mind, those are, those are pretty far apart. So let's consider what it means when we talk about security in the context of software. Um, and I like to think about this in, in terms of, and it, it's an interesting idea to me, because people don't normally mention QAs and security analysts in the same breath. But to me, um, security pro, uh, QA professionals and security people have a lot in common. Like, we're all concerned about the behavior of software, about the actual behavior. And some of this actual behavior is going to be defined by a specification. Um, it might be a formal specification, or more commonly, it's an informal specification. QAs are going to investigate this behavior, and they're going to find uh, areas where the software does it what it's supposed to, and then they'll find some areas where the software does not do what they're supposed to. And a good QA is going to expand the specification as they work, ask the right questions, and, and say, let's really hone down what this is supposed to do. So um, security analysts are also interested in this space, but they're especially interested in areas where uh, the software does other stuff that maybe isn't in the specification. Um, areas where the behavior fall, or maybe even areas where the, the specification is self-contradictory. So to recap, a QA might ask, does the software do what it should? And the security analyst might say, does it also do anything else? But one of the things that all of us should be thinking about is, do we even understand what it is that the software is supposed to do? So as a developer, we look at these specifications, and then we look at the checklists that we get from, from OWASP and other places, 
and they say, hmm, that, that's a lot of stuff. And the, the problem is, there, there are two problems with this. One is that there's no item on this list that's a bad idea. These are all really good ideas. And the other is that there is exactly no bottom to this list. It goes on and on and on and on. And in a software project that has to add new features and actually deliver value to users, um, we know that doing everything is impossible. So the goal um, of collaborating between security, a security team and a development team is to build a recipe rather than a grocery store. We want to assemble a suite of components that builds the design, and especially we want to question what it is the software is supposed to do. If there are any inherently unsafe features in the specification, we want to look at changing the specification. Um, in a lot of domains, there are non-obvious risks to human safety that fall outside of traditional security rules, um, that guidelines that we give people. So one of, the, one of the sort of old chestnuts that we tell people is never click on links in email, never click on attachments in email. But nearly everyone in this room, I think, if you work for a company of any size, um, you have someone, probably in HR, where a fundamental part of their job is opening PDFs and Word documents from idiots on the internet, right? That is what they do. So instead of telling them, no, we're not, you're not allowed to do your job, we need to think of a safe way for them to do it. Like maybe they need to read their email on an iPad, or, or we'll, we'll come up with a way to make it work. But we can't just tell people, no, you can't do your job. Um, another um, sort of, again, chestnut, uh, it's, it's this assumption that certainly a lot of developers have in their heads. I think uh, many security people understand this, but developers tend to think of things as safe or unsafe. And like every bad password policy comes out of this idea that there are safe things and unsafe things. Um, we need, we can't just, you know, say this is secure, this is not secure. We have to teach the developers about a threat model. If you use the word threat model, so let, let me ask a real quick question here. How many people as part of their job actively build threat models on a regular basis? Okay, we got two people in here. If I ask uh, a room full of developers, um, how many people have at least heard of threat model? Okay, if I ask that question in a uh, room full of developers, you get the two hands. Okay, it's, it's an idea that's foreign to them, and maybe one of the best pieces of value that you can deliver to a development team is helping them understand what threat modeling is, and especially helping them understand the threat model from their, from their business domain. So I want to consider some places where the threat model was inadequate. Um, Amazon sold thousands and thousands and thousands of counterfeit Eclipse glasses to people. It had the potential for real physical injury to human beings. Um, and really, they did this for weeks longer than they should have. And it, it's, I don't think they adequately consider their uh, responsibility for selling unsafe products. Um, is the spell checker in your operating system security sensitive? Uh, it might be if it automatically and silently changes your prescription. Um, iTunes is not designed as a money laundering system. It was designed to be a user hostile music player. Um, but if you have a system that accepts cash and produces refunds, people are going to use it uh, for money laundering. Um, the people who built your Wi-Fi enabled toaster probably didn't consider what they, you know, that maybe they thought the biggest risk is that they'd burn your avocado toast. Um, but they really didn't consider that, 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 that your toaster or your refrigerator might be weaponized. Um, and in some cases, we have people, you know, Facebook is designed as a system to bring people together. Um, instead, it's being used by uh, hostile governments to start actual fights um, among people. So what can we do? Um, one thing that I think that, that both QAs and security analysts understand is that you, this is not something you can just shake on a crappy app when it's done and you know automatically make everything better. You know, here's a little security, here's a little quality. You know, everything's fine now. Um, we want to be involved earlier in the development process, and sometimes people call this moving application security left, which means earlier in the development process. This is the idea of the talk. I think everybody agrees it's probably a good idea, but 
as, as an organization with a software development life cycle, we need to sort of formalize what this means. Because there are a lot of good ideas that people say, yeah, we should do that. What does it turn, translate to in terms of action? We need, we need to build this into our process in order to make sure that it happens. OK, so what does this mean? Um, I went looking for some examples of um, research that people have done on how to build security into, uh, into a production software development lifecycle. And frankly, it's a bit thin. Um, this is release two. It's the last release from 2008. So this is 10 years old. Uh, it hasn't been refreshed since then. Of a NIST standard for security considerations in the software development lifecycle. Um, the standard has five phases. Uh, the first is initiation. The second phase that I focus on is development or acquisition of software. Third phase is implementation and assessment. Fourth, operations and maintenance. Fifth is disposal. So, as you might expect, expect from a NIST standard, it's hundreds of pages long, but this is their overview of the second phase, which is the one that's interesting to me, which is development or acquisition of software. And the interesting thing about this overview is that actual development of software appears nowhere here. So in spite of the idea that this is, that this is um, a system for helping you build security into the development of your software, um, they really don't address the unification of security and development. OK, so what are some other efforts? Um, Microsoft has uh, built a secure development lifecycle. Uh, this, this initialism here as TLC actually stands for about three different things. But in, in Microsoft's parlance, this is a secure development lifecycle. Um, they have recommendations for process, which are useful. Um, they also ship some tools, one of which you'll see a great deal of later in the talk, which is the threat modeling tool. I really like the Microsoft threat modeling tool. Um, it's, a good, it's a good tool, and it's also free, uh, so I recommend you look at that. Um, but with the exception of threat modeling here, uh, which you absolutely should do, the emphasis is on technical and process control, more so than domain knowledge uh, and secure application design. So like one of the fundamental things that I think that, that security teams should do is make recommendations for removing features from software. And other than, than talking, than this added admonition to use threat modeling, they really don't, don't talk very much about that end of the process. Um, so this is worth looking at only because you know it, it's one person's approach to how to do it. Um, but it's not a satisfying answer for me. I'd like something that I can point people to and say, use this process and it'll work. And by the way, I did not mention at the beginning, but I have an hour's worth of material, and I've got 50 minutes to deliver it, so I'm not planning on dead air for questions at the end. But I absolutely do welcome your questions and feedback. So just raise your hands or shout out if you have anything you'd like me to, to cover a little more. I'd be happy to take the questions. Um, Here's another uh, stab at a secure development lifecycle. This is a project uh, that OWASP has started, but it's still in an early draft phase. I couldn't take a lot, a lot out of it at this point. Um, but if you're interested in building something better, there is an open source effort to do that. And so I'm sure they'd be happy to have your participation. Um, many software development teams use an agile process, which maybe looks something like this. and. Um, you know, we tend to think about security as, well, I wouldn't say we tend to think about it. Security as practiced is often either the pen testers are going to come when product development is done and do a lot of work at the end, or there's going to be a lot of design up front. Um, there will be formal specifications written. So one thing I think about since agile processes are so common is how could we overlay a secure development life cycle into an agile process. So I've just dropped a lot of uh, things on here that I'm not going to explain right now because I'm going to cover this later in the talk. But I think it is actually pretty easy to lay security work. If, as long as you get the go ahead to work with a development team on an ongoing basis, I think there is a process for secure development that fits really well um, on you know, within the actual model. So, um, like I said, we're going to cut. We'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the first principles and about threat modeling.
In fact, let's talk about threat modeling now. Um, in order to make good security decisions, we need an accurate threat model. Um, a lot of you said you're familiar with threat modeling, but I want to—I have a slightly different take than, than some people on this. Um, so I want, I want to just have a quick overview of how I think about threat modeling. Um, there are three questions that we have to answer. The first is who is affected by your software? And this is the area that I think a lot of people's threat model uh, could use a lot more depth. The second is what you have, and the third is what could go wrong. So let's expand on all of those. Uh, we'll start with who. This includes a lot of people, and not just people who click on links on your software. Um, so you have to ask yourself, who are your users, your customers? Uh, users and customers are not necessarily the same thing, right? Um, who are your employees, the people on your team? Who are your stakeholders in your organization? Do you partner with other organizations? And who are the people in your community? Um, when I look at threat models that even very good people can produce, they often don't have a comprehensive list of actors who are affected by software, and this is why I think we end up with collateral damage, like the examples I showed you earlier in the talk. Um, the more conventional approach to a threat model, which is still really important, is what do you have? And again, this needs to be comprehensive. Obviously, it needs to include a comprehensive list of infrastructure, but also data, and not just data um, you know, in a database or a local file that you have, but data in a user's browser cache, uh, data in their smartwatch. Um, we need to, to explicitly lay out the trust boundaries, which are both explicit boundaries, like an internet boundary, but also implicit boundaries, like um, we might have a privilege escalation, or we might have a trust model that we expect to change over time. And then we need an enumeration of things that could go wrong. And for those of you who, have, who haven't seen it, this is a feature of the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool. Um, after you draw a diagram of the actors and the, the entities in your threat model, it will help you produce a list of potential threats and then give you tools to triage them that we'll look at a little bit later. Um, so, Really important is that as a security team, and this is another thing that Dave talked on, we don't, we don't want to just dump a bunch of threats on the development team and say, go fix this stuff. We want to be proactive members that help them change their infrastructure or give good strategies to uh, mitigate or terminate the risk or work with the business to say, this is a risk that we're going to accept. So in order to do that, we have to be very familiar with the problem domain. Um, so some things I like to consider are, like I said, um, first of all, consider taking care of people. Learn from history. Now, this is the Maginot Line, a very famous security failure. Um, talk to business analysts or red team members about their past experience. We need to be very aware of existential threats. Um, in 2012, a software bug caused Knight Capital's high-speed trading system to issue millions of bad trades over 45 minutes. It cost the company $440 million and effectively ended their business. Um, and we need to, to be very aware of, regula of regulation. How many people here are familiar with the GDPR? OK, I see maybe a quarter of the people. If you produce software that is ever going to be used by a European, uh, this needs to be in your vocabulary. It's in some ways, it's complex, and in some ways, it's not so complex. Um, but in, in the same way that HIPAA and PCI are, are regulations that affect us in the United States, GDPR affects uh, you in Europe. And kind of like HIPAA and PCI, um, the, the bark is a little worse than the bite. Uh, people are very concerned about this because it's new, but the implications are interesting. So one thing that, that um, some people have heard of is the right to be forgotten. And okay, this is this, is this notion that, that someone can ask that their personal data is removed from a company's database, and you need to be able to do that. Uh, but what I think is really interesting is, is this has implications for software architecture. So many software systems are built around this notion of event sourcing, where a user interacts with the site, we store all those events, and later we derive some relational model that's, that's shown to them. Um, if you are an event sourcing, and someone asks you to forget your personal data, that's an interesting software development problem. 
not the end of the world, but it is definitely something that has to be considered. Again, if your software will ever be used by any European, this is something that you need to think about. So, um, like I said, it, it, it's pretty clear that just training developers or giving them checklists has not resulted in um, in secure software. And there are reasons for this. And like, one is that it becomes one of those things that if you ask me to do everything, if everything is a number one priority, uh, there's no way I can get to that. But I think there's a, there's another thing going on there as well, is that if you tell someone to do this and this and this, if they're competent, they might do it. But what, what, what you really want to do in order to supercharge the process is you want to give the developers an understanding of the threat model. You want to give the developers uh, a strategy for building secure software. And you want it, the developer to be able to use your own, their own intelligence and their own deep knowledge of how the code works to go beyond the advice that they get in the training and the checklist. Okay? So how do you do this? Um, sometimes, you know, there are things that we can say, we'll turn on this specific feature or, or you know, add, uh, you know, this tool, you know, to your code or whatever to your CI process. But when we're dealing with developers, we have to say, how should they secure their app, which uses next week's JavaScript framework? Like the checklists don't even exist yet. So I went looking for research on how to develop security standards in places where security standards don't exist. And the thing that I ended up liking the most is this, um, the seven principles, some basic principles of, of software security. Um, this is from Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Um, this uh, book is available from O'Reilly, but there's actually a free version, I have a, a, which is only slightly different. I have that linked at the very end of the deck. Um, so I'm going to go through the seven principles first just to explain what they are, and then uh, we're going to run through a working example of a real system that I built uh, with a client and say, how do, you approach, how do you use these principles in order to both build a threat model and to build an application architecture considering them? And how does this work in a real software development process? So the first principle is comprehensivity. Uh, some of these words are a bit, mouth, a bit of a mouthful, but this one basically means you have to be exhaustive in considering all relevant factors. So identify and account for all relevant systems, actors, and risks in the environment. So this is a very tall order. Most of us probably can't sit down and make a list of every risk that applies to a project in one sitting. But that's OK. Um, these are not steps along a path. You don't do the first, and then the second, and then the third. These are principles that are designed to interrelate and build, with one, and build on one another. So you just take your first cut at this, then you consider the second principle, the third. You're going to loop round and round as the software development process goes on. The second principle is opportunity. We want to take advantage of actor relationships, material resources, and strategic opportunities in the environment. Uh, one opportunity is a conference like this. You come here, you interact with other people, you learn not only interesting information from Dave's experience, but you also network with people. You, you, make, you, you get opportunities to connect with people, and later on you can call people up and say, hey, I remember you're an expert at this. We have a need at this. Um, third is rigor. We need to specify and enforce the expected states, behaviors, and processes governing the relevant uh, systems and actors. Uh, if, if anyone's ever read about language theoretic security, this is my, one of my favorite examples of rigor. We're dealing with potential hostile data from the outside world. How, you know, many systems take potentially hostile input. Is there a way that we can do this? Language theoretic security, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on in this talk, but I'd be happy to chat with you later, um, is one potential answer to that. And it's by taking a rigorous approach to what we accept and what we don't. Fourth principle, minimization. Minimize the size, quantity, and complexity of what's to be protected. Limit externally facing points of attack. Fifth principle, compartmentalization. Totally isolate system elements, then enable and control the interactions that are essential for their intended purposes. We often think of this in terms of like a firewall or a network boundary, but we know that networking 
network partitioning is often leaking due to phishing. Um, this is really more about stopping lateral movement than it is, you know, having some inner sanctum that no attacker is ever supposed to be entered. Six, uh, fault tolerance. Anticipate and address potential compromise and failure of system elements and security controls. Um, there is interesting research that I can point you to if you're interested that says that disasters in software are not normally the result of bugs. Rather, they're usually the result of bad error handling of minor bugs. And this is true in security as well. Six principle, proportionality. Take tailor security strategies to the degree of risk, accounting for the practical constraints imposed by the use case and the environment. Okay, so these are all interesting considerations. One of the things that you may notice if, as we went through here is they're not really software specific, and that's on purpose. Um, the principles were developed by studying, defending of many things, not just software, but military strategies of community design. They're intended to be universal and not specific to any particular type of software development. So I want to go through a real example of something I built and show how we can use these principles. Uh, and and the, the, the idea here is that this is something that should work for a development team who has access to a good security analyst, but not necessarily any particular grounding in security directly. So I'm going to spell out some things um, that may seem kind of obvious to a lot of you, but you all are smart people who come to B-sides. Like, this is not the typical uh, group of people who are designing a software system. So I'm going to, I'm, again, I want something that you, that you can deliver and work with a software team um, who might not have the understanding that you do. So first, the business problem that we had to solve. There was a hotel chain that um, if you are like a parent and you have a kid, like my kid's at a robotics competition in Dayton right now, you might have a kid who's doing uh, sports and is going to stay in a hotel without you, but there needs to be a credit card on file uh, for any potential incidentals in the hotel. So the way the hotel used to do this is that the cardholder would fill out a paper form uh, with their credit card number and the CVV2 and all the rest, fax it to the hotel manager who would put it in a special folder that hopefully only they saw. Um, the hotel did realize that this was problematic, and so to their credit, they went and said, we need a better system for this. Um, they wanted something online where you could fill in your credit card online, and then it would be made available to the general manager in, only in the case that there was a need to charge for incidentals, okay? Um, so, so um, there, there were a few other requirements as well, like they didn't want you to have to sign up and make an account for this. They wanted it to be very easy. Um, so where do you even begin on a, a problem like that? Well, um, one thing that you can do is just start with a naive solution. And there's really no shame in doing this as long as you don't end there, okay? Th this at least gives us a, you know, a straw man that we can, we can say, this is inadequate and let's, let's talk about the ways that we can build a better solution. Okay, so um, basically we have the card holder uses a web application um, that, that stores the card, credit card information in a SQL database. And because we care about security, we're using HTTPS. Um, problem solved? Probably not. Um, again, you, you might see some problems with this design, but again, you're smart people. Like, you know this stuff. Like, a developer might actually start here. So let's ask the developers to apply the first of the seven principles, which is comprehensivity. Um, our naive solution was actually a bit oversimplified, even like from a developer point of view. From a purely technical level, we've omitted quite a bit here that we need to add to our threat model. Uh, because uh, you know the end user didn't want to host the, the system themselves. They wanted to use some kind of cloud hosting. So we're going to add all that information to the diagram. Okay. Um, again, we haven't really increased the security here, but maybe we can increase our knowledge of the system a little bit. Um, so speaking of comprehensivity, let's talk with the domain experts. It's like, my, my gut feel might be that the biggest risk with this system is theft of credit card numbers, but it turns out that the hotel, what they have experience with this, and what they're really uh, concerned with is um, use, they don't want their site used to validate stolen credit card numbers. 
Um, so we're going to add that to the diagram. And the domain expert also points out that we had omitted some actors from the original threat model. So I'm going to include them as well. Uh, it's not clear exactly where they fit in at this point, but we're just getting started. We're trying to, to add as much knowledge to the threat model as we can. Um, so having done that, the, the threat modeling tool produces a list of potential risks that is already fairly long, and we haven't even gotten to the point where we've built a secure system yet. Um, so we have to think that the, the point of comprehensivity is not just identifying actors, but also accounting for them. Um, so we, we can do this in the analysis view. I'm not going to account for threats right now because we're still going through the process. Um, in general, we should expect when we're getting started to go through all seven principles at least twice. Um, but we're already good, off to a good start. Um, the hotel also has some existing security infrastructure, including static analysis and CI builds and some continuous monitoring they do. We'll consider this in a moment, but I want to bring it up right now in order to emphasize that this notion of comprehensivity means comprehensivity over time, as well as comprehensivity in space. Um, another uh, idea that falls into this notion of comprehensivity is training, but we have to think about training on the right thing. Is OWASP top 10 training really going to be the thing that makes the difference for your organization? Maybe the most effective thing you could do is create a threat model and train the developers on the threat model. Um, training is potentially expensive. We need to, to think, how can we use those hours to have the greatest effect? For the opportunity principle, there's three things we have to consider. Uh, we have to consider the actor relationships. So the, the hotel's existing infrastructure and AWS, they have a relationship with the credit tokenization service uh, that might be useful for the thing that we're building here. Um, we need to think about material resources. Um, we need to follow the AWS security best practices white paper. Uh, we might want to use managed services instead of maintaining bare metal. And this is the area where the checklists like the OWASP Top 10 and the AWS Best Practices White Paper are actually useful. Um, and we're going to look for strategic opportunities. We want to work with business users to design a process that doesn't require creating accounts and passwords. We also want to consider, like, are there trade industry trade groups that monitor threats to systems like this and, and allow for information sharing? Um, there's obviously a lot more that we could do. I, you know, I can't spell out everything in, in, in the few minutes I have left in the talk, but, but you get the idea here. Um, so for rigor, we want to depart from the threat model for a second, because our goal is not to produce a threat model. Uh, the threat model is useful for our real goal, which is to produce a secure system. Uh, the threat model is in service of the principles. So rigor has two steps, which is specification and enforcement. And you can specify with varying degrees of formality. So here we're using a, an informal sequence diagram, which is you know, maybe a little bit more formal than a plain English description we often have as a specification for software. Um, but for certain problems, we want to go even more formal and use a tool like TLA Plus uh, to fully modify, the, to fully specify the behavior of the system and to have an exhaustive uh, an exhaustive checker for, for the model. And then the second is enforcement of the specification. Once you have the specification, how do you prove that it's in use? Uh, one way to do this is with your language's type system. Uh, you can build a tool where invalid state is impossible to construct. Um, another way to enforce rigor is with static analysis. Uh, this is practically free. Um, you, you, you can turn it on and maybe grandfather in any failed rules. And then it protects new code forever. I really, really, really am a fan of static analysis. It doesn't solve all of your problems. It doesn't even solve most of your problems. But it's hard to beat the cost-benefit ratio of a static analysis system. So I want to step back a second and say we've gone from this naive implementation on the top to something that is a fair bit more complicated. And in my mind, we're not even at the point yet where we have a system that we can be de described as secure. What we really have at this point is just a more accurate description of that naive system that, that we were looking at building uh, to begin with. But you know, we do have some security features in here, so that might be good. Like, more is better, you know, you want to defend some depth? Maybe. Um, the principle of minimization applies in many ways to our project. We want to minimize the attack surface by putting servers behind firewalls. 
Uh, we want to block SSH into the private network, except maybe via a jump server. We want to minimize the tools that we have in use. Um, AWS actually makes this a little harder because it feels like putting together a Lego set sometime. Um, you know, if we can remove user interfaces from the software, that's great. Delete code, minimize everything. Um, another thing that I think that, that we don't give enough thought to in terms of minimization is what we store. Uh, you don't want to make yourself a target, so to speak. Um, it's not just a good idea, it might be a compliance requirement. Um, the default behavior of most databases is to store information forever, um, except MongoDB. Um, so you might want to really think about, if I put a user's information in the database, do I need to then add a procedure that's going to remove it after a period of time? We want to change the default to something that is gives us enough data to get our business done, but the surest way to stop people from stealing data that you collect is to destroy it. So whatever extent you can do, that's a really interesting way to do minimization. For compartmentalization, there's two steps to this. We want to totally isolate each element on the system and then selectively enable the specific interactions needed. Uh, it used to be when you installed SQL Server, it would come up with, you know, internet interface, TCP, IP, and, and UDP, and other interfaces. Um, today, when you install SQL Server, no interfaces are turned on. You have to go and manually enable the, the ones that you specifically need. Just having a sensible default did quite a lot for the security of that product. Um, a great place to start on this is any place on your, on your threat model diagram where data flows cross security boundaries. And these are actually pretty easy to see just by eyeball. Um, compartmentalization, as I mentioned before, is a bit of a double-edged sword because, yes, you're stopping the attacker from lateral movement, but you're also stopping your own insights. And so I think that this quote is a really interesting take on compartmentalization, where you put a barrier in your, uh, in your design, you may be making lateral movement harder, you may be making your own telemetry harder at the same point, at the same time. So <coughs> something to think about when you're compartmentalizing a system. So next uh, part of compartmentalization is least privilege. This might have seemed, at first seemed to conflict with the principle of human-centered design. Like I've often been told as a developer that there is necessarily a trade-off between security and convenience. I no longer believe that's true. Um, as someone who recognizes my own fallibility, I'm very much aware that I screw stuff up. Um, I don't want to be able to just delete any file on a disk that I can, like because I will definitely screw that up. I want there to be, you know, safety switches and behaviors. Um, but if you use a human-centered design, you can find a good balance between giving people the ability that, that, to do things they need with the appropriate checks and balances. So here are some decisions we might make in this specific project. And again, if we, if we had all day to spend on this project, we, we might be able to uh, arrive at more, at more decisions if we drill down a little more deeply. Next uh, principle is fault tolerance. You have to consider fault tolerance at every point in the system. And we often think about in terms of handling errors and, and you know, dealing with potentially flaky components. I'm going to give a different example here because I think it expands the thinking of what fault tolerance really means, which is compromised credentials. Um, we should do error analysis for every system and every in, in, entry point, but um, Again, I want to get the, 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 this notion of fault tolerance needs to include um, information leaks, not just technical faults. Um, so the typical response to information leaks is free credit monitoring. Um, as someone whose information, uh, you know, if any of you have the Equifax down, hi, I'm in it. Um, so can we do better? Um, again, this, this really involves speaking with the end users. Uh, listening to their concerns, 
it may be that you know we can't put the genie out of the bottle and there's really nothing that we can do, but we're not going to know if that's the situation if we never really engage with the end users. So if we harm somebody, we have to go talk with them and say, what can we do to make it right? Okay, so having gotten this far, we have this really extensive list of risks. The principle of proportionality says um, we want to make sure that we spend time on the appropriate issues. The, the threat modeling tool, which again is free and I think is super useful, um, has a system for triaging uh, the issues that we come up with and to say, you know, is this something, the default state of, of an issue is not started, we can say, this is actually something that was automatically genera generated and not applicable to, um, to our situation at all. Uh, maybe it's something that, that we think is potentially applicable and needs an investigation, or maybe it's something that, that we have already looked at and we've already mitigated. So we want to go through, we can change not only the status, but also the priority. So we want to, again, uh, we want to give the developers a ranked backlog of issues, and then we want to engage with the developers on every sprint and say, um, what are the most important things that, re that we can do right now to end up with a more secure system? Okay? The basic principles, the seven principles that we've worked through interact. You can just go through them once up front uh, in an application design. In the upfront analysis, we're going to go through those, those seven principles at least twice. Um, but if you're in an agile process and you're doing sprint planning, I would plan on going through through the, the seven principles at the beginning of each sprint in order to groom the backlog. We want to have security concerns in the same product backlog as the features that we're delivering to the end user because maybe security actually is a feature for the end user and so we want to rank these appropriately along with the rest of the work the team has to do and we need to plan a good strategy with the team on the most effective way to mitigate the risks that we identify. Um, in, in, a, in a sense I would say that this kind of design works even better in an agile environment if it encourages both you and the development team to keep growing water from the security well. Um, if you're interested in these ideas, um, the, the, the reference I really recommend, and this is linked here, is the Information Security Practice Principles. This is the free version of the O'Reilly cover that I showed you earlier. Um, if, if you have, I don't remember the, the O'Reilly uh, online service name, uh, but they, they actually make it for, for available for free if you have a membership in that service. Or um, there's a slightly different version, which in my mind is pretty much just as good uh, that, you can, that you can get through the link right here. Um, for, as, a, as a reference for threat modeling, the, the best thing that I know of is this book called Threat Modeling Design for Security by Adam Shostak. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit um, imperfect in that it's pretty old, which is not a problem by itself, because a lot of these ideas haven't changed too much. But a lot of the structure of the book is around some external resources he identifies that are actually no longer available in the 10 years or so since it's been published. So it's the best reference that I know of for threat modeling, but it's, it's a little bit flawed. I would definitely start with this, with this book here, which is um, actually shorter. <laughs> so it, it's an easy read. It's only about 80 pages. Um, this is just credits for some of the stock photos I used. And this is a, a few different ways to reach out to me uh, if you'd like to talk further. I'd really appreciate hearing your thoughts on this. Um, also, I run a group in town called Papers We Love. Um, if there are any of you out here who like to read um, academic um, computer science theory, um, you're, you're my kind of person. I'd, I'd love to chat with you. Uh, we have a book club downtown where we read books and we read technical papers from the computer science community and talk with them over pizza. Uh, we meet downtown uh, every couple of weeks. So thanks very much for, for coming out. Um, it is 11.26 right now, so I have three minutes uh, until the next speaker should be here and start talking. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you now, but if you'd like to go over to a different auditorium to catch your next talk, I will not hold that against you. Uh, thanks a lot again for coming out. And for anyone
sometimes we prefer like the death trait method of contacting some of this person. So, what I would say, not necessarily on the diagram, that's more for attacking the slides, but I think it is really important to include the attacker on the list of people who potentially interact with the software. Um, so, does it have to be on your diagram? Yeah, um, but it is something that you absolutely need to do. Yes, yeah, so once we... Yeah. 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 Yeah.